It's time for Atomic Monsoon with your hosts, Psycho Andy. And the internet went, <gasps> oh, Josh. That uh, opens up a lot of possibilities in the future. <laughs> you just got me excited here. And Jedi Stephanie. They get like a staff and they try to bring him back with it and they only bring back his lower half. And now it's Atomic Monsoon. You know, I really like that song that we have for our intro from the Def M Records All-Stars. You mean our theme song to our show Atomic Monsoon? That one. That one. The show you're listening to right now, Atomic Monsoon. That music you just heard. By Def M Records. Totally, by Def M Records. Yeah. Yeah. You should all go to defmrecords.bandcamp.com and support the guys that made our, our excellent intro music because they're good people. And uh, and we like supporting our friends and family. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Speaking yeah. of friends and family, Andy. Yeah. We have a special guest on today. Hey, we do. We have someone that is both a friend and family. Uh, More to you we have than Alex me, George yeah. Pickering. <laughs> well, well, for sure. <laughs> yeah, we have Alex George Pickering joining us. Alex, say hello to everybody. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so Alex and I are related by blood. Um, uh, I, I have embarrassing photos of the two of us from before we could walk, hanging out together, being pals. Um, so, <laughs> uh, Alex is a, a an award win- uh, mm. Alex is an award winning filmmaker out in the beautiful Los Angeles, California. Although I guess you you moved during uh, during quarantine here. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, Alex has some stuff going on, and and we thought, hey, we should have him on the show and talk about what he's doing and and what the life of, him, uh, of a filmmaker is like. And it sounded like fun. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you for having me. And yeah, it's it's definitely fun to finally be here. And I've listened to a lot of episodes of Atomic Monsoon, and Andy is correct that he is probably my longest standing friend in many ways. You know, from age three until. Um, you know, the ripe old ages we are now. And, uh, but he's also family. So that's great too, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. I mean, outside of our siblings, you know, we're probably each other's longest standing friends. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Sibling. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but yes, no, it, it's, uh, so yeah, I'm an emerging screenwriter, producer, graduated from USC School of Cinematic, Cinematic Arts MFA program uh, 10 years ago. And so I've been writing digital content and I teach film production and digital arts. And now I'm finally moving into getting some of my feature scripts, hopefully off the ground here. Um, but yeah, just kind of a independent screenwriter producer in SoCal. That's awesome. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's definitely a journey and the journey continues. It's also been, um, there's been ups and downs, but it's, it's kind of been an interesting time this past year. Uh, obviously COVID has been very difficult on the industry. A lot of people mm-hmm. are going through a lot. Um, yeah. but yeah. I, I, I've had some amazing strides this past year. So it's an awkward kind of, um, silver lining, you know, I'd say. Well, that's good. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's been fascinating to see, uh, you know, uh, obviously, like we don't want anyone to, to be suffering or, or mm-hmm. anyone to lose their jobs or anything. You know, we want we want everyone to, to be doing well. Um, but it's been interesting to see that while some people are having a really hard time, other people are are. Yeah, like you said, having, you know, these weird silver silver linings uh, through this whole experience. Um, so, yeah. So tell mm-hmm. us tell us some more about that. Yeah, yeah. Um... Well, so basically this past year, um, I have a writing partner named Matthew Bro. He and I have basically been kind of writing together for several years. You know, years ago, we did a short film together um, called Ephraim, which did, you know, decently well in the festival circuits and so forth. And we've just been kind of writing together for years. And, you know, we wrote some scripts recently that, you know, we've put out there into different competitions. And we kind of just did, you know, like a script kind of blitz approach where we just really tried to make ourselves, um, you know, unavoidable, you know? So, you know, we submitted to, you know, Nickel Fellowship, we made, you know, twice with one of the scripts and, you know, um, ScreenCraft recently, we made the semifinals. Last year, we made the finals twice. And um, slowly over time, we sort of built kind of, uh, you know, inched our way into the zeitgeist of, you know, 
new writers that are emerging. And um, yeah, recently we've just been in talks to, to well, actually, I, in fact, something recently just happened this past week. I was telling you about Andy off the mm -hmm. air. I can talk about it a little bit, but yeah, one of our scripts uh, has been optioned and is going to be, to be made into a movie. Um, so that was really one of the great, you know, uh, silver linings of this past year, you know, slowly wow. getting our, our reputation up. Yeah, thank you. And um, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. We wrote that script to really be, it's called Crate. It was to be a very contained movie that we were going to try to shoot ourselves. And so it all takes place mo mostly in one location. Um, and then, you know, we put it out there. It was very popular in terms of just, I guess, um, kind of being a very, you know, it's a thriller horror, very, you know, Hitchcockian, I'd like to say, in a way, kind of, you know, a suspense thriller with just people trapped in a box. In this case, it all takes place in a shipping container on a boat, stowaways mm -hmm. on a boat traveling across the ocean, and there's a murderer basically on board. Um, so that script, you know, it got into a couple competitions, and then recently, um, you know, I spoke with the company. They said it was okay to even break the news today, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, although okay. I'm gonna probably. <laughs> I'll probably do, you know me, Andy, I'll probably do my big like Facebook, hey, you know, Twitter, oh, sure. Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, once they do a post or um, or Coverfly, the big kind of screenwriting award website, once they do a post about it, mm -hmm. I'll probably say something. But yeah, it's Wavelets Entertainment that optioned it. And, um, you know, they have some really, um, you know, some some big investment companies in China, you know, Ali, Alibaba Group Holding Limited. Uh, Media Asia and so forth that are their investment um, companies behind them. So they're really interested in getting, you know, horror thrillers that can be kind of shot and, and executed and then uh, released very quickly. So I think that's what attracted them to the script, hopefully. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, beyond that, I, I can't say too much about the deal and what's happening with it, but it is definitely the wheels are turning and that's uh, that's an exciting next step for us, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Congratulations, that's really awesome. man. Yeah, congrats. <laughs> no, no, thank you guys. I mean, you know, and this is, by the way, I, I've had 10 years of submitting scripts, you know, sometimes having some great feedback and getting into competitions. And then sometimes just people saying, listen, it's a nice script, but it's not what we're looking for right now. And so it, it, it is kind of being an indie filmmaker in L.A., um, mm -hmm. even going to USC, which is a really great um you know, it's a really great film program. It's not going to just guarantee anything. It's still a grind. Right. Mm -hmm. um, even working with, um, you know, big people. I mean, I as as you know, Andy, I I, I wrote a, a short film years ago for Ryan Coogler, um, the director of Black Panther. Uh, now he's basically king of the world and right. um, <laughs> still a really great friend. And I, I, you know, I recently reached out to him because, of course, Chadwick passed away, and that was that was that was horrific. That was awful. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, and we did a little short film together, Fig, and it, it, it did get a little run on HBO. And that was, an, that was a great stepping stone for many of us. Um, mm -hmm. But it's still a grind. I mean, it's still even a lot of my USC professors, you know, they're trying to rub two sticks together, um, you know, especially in this, this environment with COVID. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's, you know, the past year, the fact that I've had any success, I'm just grateful for, you know. Um, so you know, the journey continues. And, um, you know, the other big script that I've told you about, Andy, is, uh, you know, this was something that really Matt and I had thought about a little bit. And we're like, would this actually work as a movie? And, and you know, the etymology of it was really, we had a friend, I don't think he'd mind me saying his name, Jeremy Cohen, um, who wrote a script called George which was about the couple that created the popular children's book series, Curious George. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. And I guess like they survived the Holocaust and there's like this whole amazing journey. And so Jeremy, like super smart guy, a uh, USC friend of mine, he just like researched it and just wrote like, you know, a script. He just researched it and, and, and put it out there. And, um, and now it's, I believe it's, yeah, same thing. It's like under option purchase deal. I, I don't, the wheels are hopefully turning on it, but, mm -hmm. um, it was such a smart idea. It's a brilliant way of kind of writing a, writing about, um, it's a brilliant way of writing about what I call IP intellectual property without having to secure the rights, you mm -hmm. know, to a deep, you know, to a deeply researched historical figure, you sure. know? So it's like a journalistic yeah. approach to getting that 
you know, um, without having to um, necessarily approach them, you know? So that's, that's something that I was like, so I sat there, I was like, oh my God, what's another biopic about someone where we can get IP um, intellectual property that we can write about that would be interesting. And so there's like Steve Jobs or Steve, you know, Stephen Hawking was the mm-hmm. theory of everything. Mm-hmm. You know, Mark Zuckerberg's social network. And more recently, you've seen probably like nerd culture figures that like Tolkien, um, mm-hmm. although I know he's like mainstream, but you know, they're getting a little bit more like, okay, we'll do a Tolkien movie. They're going to do a Hulk Hogan one, right? right. Um, yeah. And yeah, so we I've don't pre- know anything about nerd culture on this show. <laughs> yeah exactly right guys so um yeah, yeah. but that's the that's that's a good thing though the world has become more like open to that and so yeah and so it, it occurred to me i was like you know there's one person primarily behind super mario one of the most like ubiquitous characters of all time known in virtually every country around the world and that's uh, shigeru Miyamoto, you know a man mm-hmm. who fathered you know the legend of zelda and donkey kong and countless others um you know in fact, Super Mario, this is something that's in our script, it's actually a 1990s Q survey determined that Mario was more popular among children than Mickey Mouse. Mm-hmm. So yeah. why hasn't there been a movie about this? Um, you know, that was something that I, I, so I went to Matt with it, my writing partner, and I pitched it to him. You know, one of the things we talked about is, sure, there could be an interesting, um, you know, there could be big IP behind it, like Mario, but there has to be a story. There has to be a journey, you know, if it's just, you know, nothing of conflict happened, it's not going to be that interesting. So, so we looked into it, we read some books, looked at some articles, watched some videos, and it turns out it's an incredible and unlikely story. I mean, you know, Nintendo of America, as we know, it almost never happened, you know, because they were behind on their rent for their leased warehouse you know, because they bet on this popular arcade game, Raider Scope. So Raider Scope was popular in Japan. It's an arcade yeah. game, but it, but it, it didn't do well in the States. And so, hmm. so comes along this, you know, shaggy haired kind of like countercultural, almost like hippie dude, obviously not what you would think about with sort of traditional Japanese kind of businessman. Uh, you know, he grew up reading mangas, drawing you know, making homemade toys, enjoying kind of playing bluegrass on his banjo. Um, He also took five years to graduate from a four-year undergrad, you know, and no no judgments, but he was, you know, traditional Japan is a little bit more like his father was an English teacher, and he was a little bit of a a, kind of like Steve Jobs, kind of like thinking different type of guy. And and so, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not going to go into the whole plot here, but just long story short, I mean, this guy comes in with Donkey Kong and saves Nintendo. And so, you know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of the story about his relationship with his mentor, Yokoi, and, you know, a lot about what happens, you know, the fallout with that. And, um, but it's, it's really an interesting story. And, and I just couldn't believe no one had, had, had told this story and had, had made a movie about it. And everywhere we've sent this script so far, it's been that kind of like, yeah, why hasn't this happened yet? <laughs> um, uh, yeah. And the, yeah, the only thing I can think, you know, Matt and I have talked about it and, Obviously, a lot of it does take place in Japan. You know, it is going to be a movie that will be largely subtitled. Um, there is some, you know, Nintendo of America stuff happening with, you know, Howard Lincoln and, you know, uh, Ron Judy and Alan Stone and sort of the early founders of Nintendo of America. But, mm-hmm. you know, the main character is, is Japanese. And, uh, but I think everything's changing with that. I mean, you look at Parasite winning uh, Best Picture, and mm-hmm. that's all subtitles. So I think yeah. that. We're, we've reached a point in time where, you know, they're open to doing a movie like that. And uh, so we're putting that out there, too. And, you know, the script is very deeply researched. And, you know, it, it did make the semifinals of ScreenCraft's True Story competition. Um, Congratulations. And, yeah, thank you. Yeah. And, and, and we're just putting it everywhere. You know, um, we're trying to get it out there and trying to get some investment behind that as well. Um, you know, so that that's going to be a little bit of a bigger kind of movie, though. Needless to say, than than Crate. Crate is Crate is a smaller film, uh, but Jumpman would definitely be, um, as we call it, because it's based on the original name for Mario, Jumpman. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it would definitely be something in the ten to twenty million um, range. So, so that's a longer journey, but you know, mm-hmm. it's getting some attention, and that's sort of the goal. You know, um, that's that's what we're doing. Hey, get to start somewhere, right? <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
So yeah, um, I know to kind of answer your question there, um, uh, you know, why hasn't anyone done a story of Shigeru Miyamoto before? Uh, the answer is because Nintendo holds everything really close to the best. Um, after the Super Mario Brothers Super Show that I know Alex, you and I grew up watching, yeah, and the uh, the live action Mario Brothers movie with Bob Hoskins and uh, John Leguizamo and Dennis Hopper, um, uh, Nintendo wasn't super happy with the way that those turned out, and so as a result, they've been really cautious, yeah, very protective of of lending out their IPs to anybody else ever. Uh, I, I, and and as you said, you know previously in, in historically like american films with subtitles don't always necessarily do super well um mm. but yeah it, as more people are being exposed to them uh through streaming services at the very least um you know yeah parasite winning best picture is evidence that like okay we're we're moving in that direction where like it doesn't matter where the movie is best movie is best movie yeah yeah, yeah. And, and and it's also with this approach like we've been asked before hey did you go to nintendo did you talk to mr Miyamoto? And we've been honest, we said no. And to be honest with you, with the few production companies we've talked to, they've said that's the better place to be because there's really two approaches. One, you just ignore the real person in real life and you just write the movie, you cite sources, and you might change a little bit because, of course, you have to dramatize. You know, you have to kind of read through between the lines, right, about what happened. We can't see what happened in every meeting, but you try to fill it in. And that's kind of been the approach of, you know, like the Tolkien movie. You know, the estate doesn't want anything to do with that. And there was actually multiple Tolkien scripts out there. Um, so that's kind of, you know, if it's a public figure, from what I understood from my legal research, as long as you have multiple sources you can cite, you're not just copying a book. You have, like, multiple articles, multiple, you know, videos. I found this cool website that had, you know, just what in, um, I found a cool website that had what Nintendo looked like in the 1970s. Ooh. So, like the inside and you know like everything to the like the outside what the logo was on the door and so just stuff like that where you just have to kind of research it and yes could you still get sued um yeah i mean Z mark zuckerberg could have sued the people that did the social network but at the end of the day it's like you know it's a good problem to have as they say i mean if you're attracting the attention of the real life person um you know and, and again it's sort of different schools of thought yes if nintendo was on board that would be great. Then again, they might want to have more say over the portrayal of Miyamoto in the script. And that's one of the problems if you do get the permission of the people to, in real life to tell the story, the public figure or their estate, you know, they're going to say, well, you can't depict them this way or that way. And so you may mm -hmm. not get as honest a portrayal. Um, and that's why a lot of these biopics are just kind of, you're they're just doing it and they're citing sources and at the end of the day, usually it's not a, a lot, a, you know, you're not held liable unless there's like just gross kind of, you know, from what I understand, unless there's there's elements of the story which are so fantastical and so uh, disparaging of the individual that it would be <laughs> right. beyond, beyond the pale. And I mean, it's hard to really say too much bad about Miyamoto. He's such a jolly guy. We talk about that. And that's in the script. There's a little bit about him almost being, you know, too jovial and how that affects his life and how he gets very engrossed in his games and how it affects his personal life and his his you know relationship with his mentor um it's not like steve jobs you know you're not going to see a scene where you know Miyamoto is just cruel to the level of you know steve jobs could be at times according to you know historical records it's a different type of character but there could still be you know could still be a depiction of him that you know perhaps would be a problem for Nintendo, and I get that. Um, so the most honest biopics, in a way, I think, are the ones that, you know, just write about the person, tell the story, and try to work. You know, work with the lawyers. That's what they say. The, that's the yeah. lawyer's job to say like what you can and can't do. And some of it might be what you can show. You know, we might not be able to show all of you know, you know, Mario's. Uh, you know, we may not be able to show Mario interacting in you know, on a screen and different video game elements, maybe a little bit of that, maybe the packaging is okay, but maybe we can't show, you know, fair use. We're only allowed to, to show us a, a couple seconds of, you know, a Zelda game or something in the movie. Sure, um, yeah, yeah. But I mean, think of the social network. I mean, how often did they show the actual Facebook page? I think they showed it, I remember at the end, right, when he's refreshing the page over and over, 
um, a lot of it was just talked about. I mean, a lot of it is just them talking about developing different things. It's more about the character and his falling out with people. And um, so, you know, you can get away with a lot. And um, at the end of the day, we understand the script will be something that requires, you know, lawyers to look through it if it goes forward. It's, it's going to be that type of movie. Hmm. For All sure. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, yeah. Like... So, well, if it goes forward, I mean, of course, I, I would love to see a Miyamoto movie. And I think the time mm -hmm. has come, you know, I think people would love that. I mean, everybody we've talked about, everybody we've talked to has said, I just can't believe they haven't done a movie about that. That's always mm -hmm. the reaction. It's always like, yeah, Mario, everybody knows Mario. I, I, I mean, he's bigger than, than certain, I mean, Mario is bigger than most characters. If you really think about yeah. it. Think yeah, about all sure. the countries in the world, all the countries in the world that have played Super Mario. I mean, Salman Rushdie, we put a thing in our script. This is a true thing. Salman Rushdie basically got through his fatwa because he said he played Super Mario Brothers. It got him through the isolation, the, the being you know trapped inside somewhere, and he needed something to distract him. And that was such hmm. a cool, you know, that's a, such, a, such a cool little anecdote that I was like, yeah. we got to put that. We got to put that in the movie. You know? <laughs> that is cool. <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, the, the timing of talking about this is great, too, because and listen, this podcast is not sponsored by Nintendo, but uh, Super Mario 3D All-Stars comes out this weekend. Uh, Ooh. So it's, it's for the for the Nintendo Switch. So it's a re-release of Mario 64, Super Mario Sunshine and Super Mario Galaxy. One uh, Nintendo Switch thing, uh, cart, whatever, SD card. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, <laughs> just kind of the timing of, of this conversation is pretty great because it happens that weekend. Wow, yeah, no, and we just hit the 35th anniversary of the release of Super Mario Brothers in Japan. So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I I have so much. It's I, Andy. I just have to. Tell, I have this word document Matt and I share. It's 90 pages, single spaced, just facts about Nintendo. And it's Whoa. like, <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's it's not just about Miyamoto. It's like about, I have stuff in there, but like Mario Paint and everything. Like I just, we basically went through everything, the chronology. And then later we we're like, okay, what's going to actually go into the movie? We have to shape a story out of this. But it's just this like encyclopedia of details. And it's, um, it's amazing. So I, that's why it's like, I almost wish I could use it for something else too, because it's so much extra we probably use maybe 10 per, maybe no maybe even three percent of what's in there you know Jeez. uh if you think about wow. it it's just so it's uh yeah read a lot of different articles and um <laughs> it watched a lot of videos watched a lot of e3 videos you know thankfully those sure. started to stream you know mm -hmm. once the 96 one came so yeah, yeah. uh I know i know i don't remember what i sent you but i know we we um spent thanksgiving together and i did recommend a few videos to you as well because you had kind of before this was a thing told about it and i was like yeah let's here here's some more stuff that i don't know i don't know if you'd already found it or had already researched any of it or or if any of that ended up being any help but i figured hey again why hasn't someone done this <laughs> so let's <laughs> yeah you know let's put as much information into it as we can yeah, no, I appreciate. It. Yeah, the gaming historian. He's had some great um, episodes on a lot of this on a lot of this content. Um, you know, it, it's really it's interesting. And I got I went down the rabbit hole of you know one of the big things that happens is is Yokoi, the mentor of, of Shigeru Miyamoto. You know, he he dies tragically in a car accident. Yeah. Um, mm. This is this is nothing that I'm revealing. This happened in 1997, and just looking at different articles on it. And there's all these theories of like, well, that was right after he left Nintendo. So was it the, the mafia and all, and, you know, like conspiracy yeah. theory things. And I mean, some of them are way out there, but um, you know, that, that, that was definitely um, such a, uh, a turning point for Nintendo and for, for Miyamoto's life. And um, you know, that, that does, it does make its appearance in the story. So okay. um, there's yeah. a lot, yeah, there's a lot of interesting history there. Um, and I think, like I said, I, I had to make sure, is there a movie? And right. there is. There is needless to say, like, more mm -hmm. than a movie, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Gunpei Yopoi's uh, uh, death in 97 is, it, I mean, the timing on it couldn't have been worse, better? I don't know. It, it, mm -hmm. is, it is one of those, like, fairy tale things, right? Like, he, he, this is the guy that, you know, designed a lot of the things that, that brought Nintendo to the dance. He, I, if I'm not mistaken, he's the one that designed the original Game Boy. Yep. And 
um, you know, kind of the next or or the last project he did for Nintendo was the Virtual Boy, which just did not succeed. It was it was kind of Nintendo's first real big failure that we had seen since the NES had come out. And uh, he he sort of left the company, started uh, the Wonder Swan, I want to say, and then unfortunately, yeah, died in a car crash very shortly after that. And it does kind of lead to those like, well, what happened? Like, <laughs> but you know, car accidents happen every day. Uh, mm-hmm. Unfortunately, you know, it's, yeah. it, uh, there's no there's no predicting, you know, when or or if a car accident will or can happen. Uh, mm-hmm. Which is why you should always wear your safety belt, kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's and Andy, yeah. that you, that was good history on your part. Yeah, everything you said was exactly true. And the 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 virtual boy, that w- it's so sad in a way because he was such a he was the golden boy basically before Miyamoto. I mean, yeah, you know, if you go way back to the past, you talk about the love tester and um, the 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 ultra hand, and then of course. Uh, Wild Gunman, the original Wild Gunman. He 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 was basically the original genius at Nintendo. And then it's like he had one thing. He was trying to go out on a limb. I mean, he saw, you know, Miyamoto's taking all these chances and they're giving him all these opportunities. Let me try working with this, you know, um, new technology, the stereoscopic, you know, eyewear. And, you know, I get there was problems. The red was irritating and it, it mm-hmm. definitely... The fact that N64 was going to happen a year later, the timing wasn't good. But, you know, he went out on a limb and he made maybe one bad product. And I think that this is one of the things in the film. It's a debate like, you know, was he treated poorly? Was he unceremoniously released? This is why I don't know if, you know, would Nintendo ever approve of the script? Well, you have to kind of be a little honest with what happened there. And, you know, yes, he resigned. I mean, that's the go-to story. But there's a little bit you know, more to that, I would say, you know, um, Mm -hmm. anyway, don't want to get too much into the plot, but that's, again, (laughs) that's a movie that hasn't come out, (laughs) hasn't been, hasn't been fought or anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. but Hey, anyone that, that is, happens to be listening that makes movies, uh, here you go. Right. Like we, we just talked about, you know, a side character and it's a very interesting topic. Uh, you know, can you, can you imagine what the actual story of Shigeru Miyamoto <laughs> creating Donkey Kong and Mario and the Legend of Zelda is going to be like? Yeah. I can't yeah. wait. Well, unfortunately, you have to. I know. <laughs> I know. But I, and I really hope, Alex, that, this, that it all works out and everything. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, as you make progress in this industry, the great thing is, like, I think with Crate, with that stepping stone, I mean, already I was on a meeting the other day talking to some people and I was able to say kind of all oh, the wheels are turning on a deal and it's looking like it's going to happen. And as soon as you start to say like, hey, you know, we have a movie that's being made, suddenly mm-hmm. people are a little bit more like, whoa, oh, well, OK, well, we'll we'll talk to you and at least, you know, not act like you're just, you know, a desperate, hungry screenwriter trying to make it. You know, at least you can point to something like here's some people that are putting money up behind you. Um so that's why, you know, Crate, I'm really grateful for what's happening with that. And like I said, that all just happened this past week. It's that the ink isn't even necessarily dry, <laughs> you know. Sure. Um, so I was messaging Andy like, oh, my God, you're you're very uh, uh, forward thinking in a way that or, or that's not the right word. You're um, I, I compared you to Nostradamus, but you said that's a poor comparison. It's, it's too much responsibility, <laughs> man. No. <laughs> I predicted the entire history of the world before it happened. Uh, yeah. No, I, 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 listen, I just, the timing, you, you, we want to talk about create and jump man. It's in scripts. And I was like, yeah, you know, Hey, we have an opening this week, you know, this upcoming week. And you were like, sure. Great. And then it happened that, you know, things started getting signed and checks started getting written and everything like within a couple of days before right now. So mm-hmm. <laughs> like that, that's not me. That's that's the timing of we wanted to talk about uh, our favorite video games last week and then like Phineas and Ferb the week before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, definitely. Yeah. And so but yeah, it was a great it was a great time to talk with you guys today. So I, I appreciate being here. And this is this is this has been fun so far. Um, you know, um, the, the only other time I was going to just mention going back to intellectual property that I've really yeah. been able to write for that. 
as Andy, as you know, I did get to write a couple of the digital shorts for Kung Fu Panda and Puss in Boots. I was um, just going to bring those up. Yeah, yeah, because you you were kind enough. Uh, uh, guys, listen, Alex might have been the most professional guest that we've gotten on Atomic Monsoon. And I don't know <laughs> if it's because we're family or if it's this is how you do do all your business. Uh, but uh, you certainly should do it this way going forward with everyone if you if you don't. Um, Alex was kind enough oh, to send you. us links to a whole bunch of stuff that he had worked on. So, uh, and stuff that's not necessarily available to the public, just so we had an idea of what he, what he has done. Um, uh -huh. I do have a, a DVD copy of Ephraim that you sent me a number of years ago. Um, so I've seen that before, obviously. And then your, your, uh, Kung Fu Panda and Puss in Boots videos are just on YouTube. Um, so those are pretty easy to find. Um, and also Balcony, the web series Balcony, which I mentioned on our, uh, content creators creating content episode a few weeks back, about a month ago. Um, I love Balcony. I actually just rewatched the whole thing yesterday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's, yeah. it, you know, it's one of those things where like, you know, it's 10 episodes, but all 10 of them take what, like 45 minutes to watch. Like it's not, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's less than the length of a movie. Um, and then you have a small cameo as well. Yes, yes. Well, that balcony was basically Matt and I being like, we're trying so hard to sell our scripts. This is, please somebody buy it. And we're like, you know what? Let's just make something. Come on. We, 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 have equi we have equipment. We have, you know, people. We have a location. Let's just film something. And like while we're working on the bigger, you know, mm -hmm. the bigger goals, the bigger dreams, we can like release something. So that was fun. You know, it was something that we had complete control over. We didn't have to answer to anybody but ourselves. And, um, you know, we, we ended up releasing one season of it and, you know, it, it was, it was, it got a nice response. It was a small, uh, actually though, balcony is the reason we got those DreamWorks animation opportunities, believe it or, believe it or not. Um, uh, I, please tell me more about that. Well, please do. Yeah, so yeah, Matt's now wife, Leia, um, Leia Dizon. She's also, you know, a very talented independent producer. And she had a friend at um, Awesomeness TV slash D DreamWorks TV. Now everything's under Peacock. So the branding keeps changing. But anyway, sure. um, she just, Leia reached out to her and and, and uh, basically it was just the timing was right. They, they needed freelance writers for these DreamWorks shorts. And they said, do you have any comedy samples? And I was like saying to Leia, oh my God, I hope these work, these are a little more adult, you know, they're not exactly for children, you know, <laughs> geared toward children like Puss in Boots. It's a talking cat. It's, you know, it's, it's right. more for, you know, a younger audience. Um, I mean, the, the movies are for everyone, but these, these particular shorts were really geared for like the YouTube children audience. And so we sent balcony and it was, it was, it, it fit the bill. They're like, Oh, okay. They can write comedy that works. So again, some of this is just timing. If we had, it been a week later, a week earlier, maybe we wouldn't have gotten that opportunity. But right that day, they were looking for freelance writers. We had something already made that had some comedy to it, even if it's a little more adult. And, mm -hmm. you know, the rest is history. We were able to write. We actually wrote 12 episodes. Um, not all of them ends up going to air. We even wrote some of the uh, Donkey, uh, sorry, <laughs> Shrek and Donkey. We wrote some of the Shrek and Donkey episodes as well. And they, um, some of them hit the cutting room floor, unfortunately, but, um, we still got paid for those. So, you know, nice. <laughs> I mean, can't complain when you get paid, right? I mean, obviously it would be nicer. It'd be nicer if everything got made, but, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, oh, yeah. It's, it's hard to complain when they're like, well, here's your money, uh, whether we use them or not. It's like, uh, okay, great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, my, anytime I get a check for writing, it's like, even though I teach and I have my film class and digital art class, like if I even get a small check for writing, I just cradle it. And it's so precious to me because it seems like <laughs> it's just getting paid. To, you, you write for free so much for so many years. And then to mm -hmm. actually get paid, you're like, oh my, like even with Crate, you know, the first check, I just like, I'm going to hold on to this, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I've done, I've done my fair share of freelance work and, uh, yeah, the first couple the first couple checks I got as a professional graphic designer were just like, wait, really? <laughs> you guys pay me to sit in front of a computer and draw all day? Like, that's what I do in my free time. But okay, all right. Yeah, so, no, definitely. Yeah. I mean, to get paid to do that is right as a as an artist. Whatever you whatever type of artist you are, to just get paid to do it finally is such a cathartic feeling. Even if even if the paycheck is smaller at first, you know, it's great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I have I have yet to experience anything like that, but just 
audience reaction is cathartic enough for me. <laughs> Makes me feel right, good. Right, because, yeah, Stephanie teaches, uh, Alex, I don't know if you know this, Stephanie teaches uh, drama, theater, theater Tech arts? theater. Tech oh, theater, that's the word. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, all of our, actually, the three of us all kind of make this weird, this weird uh, <laughs> Triforce, right? Because you're writing <laughs> scripts for acting, she teaches acting, and then uh, you're teaching graphic design, and I am a graphic designer. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah. then Stephanie and I do this podcast, and now you're on the podcast. So yeah, this all, this is, wow. <laughs> I didn't even consider any of that. I like how you brought it home to Nintendo again with the Triforce. <laughs> I'm glad you picked up on that. <laughs> Stephanie, sorry, where do you where do you teach exactly? So I teach at a local high school in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I teach uh, tech theater and color guard. Oh, that's awesome! Cool. Yeah, that's great. Mm-hmm. Are so you guys? So go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask, are you guys, because of COVID, is it distance learning right now? Or are you are you teaching them um, uh, in class? We are distance learning right now, um, but we got the official OK Go from the district, and we are returning back after fall break with a hybrid system. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah. So. Cool, cool. It'd be and... nice to finally get back into the shop and build. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's hard, isn't it? To te- mm-hmm. like for me, even teaching remotely, like you know, the the graphic design and digital art. At least you can kind of be like, okay, Adobe, here's here's mm-hmm. here's some walkthroughs and stuff. But like with film, it's like I'm basically relying on what the students have. If they have an iPhone, they have to shoot on an mm-hmm. iPhone, you know. Yeah. Um. So I can't imagine for you, it must same thing. It must be very difficult, right from from afar. Oh yeah, no, it's definitely it's definitely a challenge that I've kind of come to figure out. So it's very much kind of lectures and learning and watching a bunch of YouTube videos and stuff like that. But once they get in the shop, now they've learned all this stuff and now we can just get right to it. Um, But I mean, at least with the filming thing for you, like you said, you know that they have, everyone, everyone has a cam camera in their back pocket now that they can film with. So, you know, just download Premiere or Final Cut or iMovie or whatever you guys use. And there you go. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's it's uh, and thankfully there's been some cool deals. Final Cut had a free 90 day trial. You know, Adobe has been sometimes. Well, I have I have a love hate with Adobe. I, I won't go into that right now, but <laughs> you know, Andy probably knows what I'm talking about. You know, Adobe I is mean, you know, look, Adobe is the industry standard for a reason, but mm-hmm. uh, also you know you become the most successful industry standard thing by stepping on some toes, right? Like that's that's just kind of how that goes. Um, so yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah. That being said, I'm going to edit this episode in Adobe audition later today. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Adobe audition. There you um, go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So, okay. So let's see, we talked about fig. We talked about your DreamWorks shorts. We talked about balcony. Um, uh, you also did some small kind of documentary style things for some, uh, Los Angeles uh, school district stuff. Is that something you want to get into, or? Yeah, I mean that was really nice because it gave me a chance to be a director. Um, so the school district, LAUSD, I, I teach adult education and career technical education, and I also partner up with the Los Angeles. Uh, I'm going to mess this up, LARIC. So it's the LA Regional Adult Education Consortium. There we go. Mm, that nice. is. Yeah, so those organizations basically work with, you know, the community colleges and the adult schools. And so I was able to put together a couple of documentaries for them. You know, one of them was just about the L.A. Public Library. And basically, it's there was this initiative to bring mostly ESL students, students that are learning English as a second language Mm -hmm. to the library and, um, you know, kind of open their eyes to opportunities there. And that was a cool one, you know. Uh, we also did basically one of them was a little bit more just like about a conference, the Lara conference. Um, and then there was another one that was about the skills USA championships, which is an or- organization in sort of the career tech space. And uh, it's like a annual competition where everybody gets together in different trades, like, you know, nursing and, you know, nail care and video production and so forth. And so a little video about that. So, you know, that was another place where I got paid to do, 
you know, video work and film film work. It's not exactly what I want to do, but at least it's in the vein of it. So it's again, kind of like on the journey, there's these other projects that are nice, you know, mm-hmm. that you get paid for. So, um, yeah, they're fun. Awesome. Yeah. So, you know, I it's, actually... it's, Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Andy, finish your thought. <laughs> okay. I was just going to say, it's interesting to me, uh, having this conversation and then thinking back, um, Josh and I interviewed Gina Ippolito, who's one of the writers for CBS's sitcom, the unicorn and, uh, listening to your journey, Alex, uh, cause even though I've sort of been on this journey with you, like obviously I'm living my own life and we don't live in the same state even anymore. Um, yeah. so like, you know, sort of hearing your stuff, uh, through this different lens as it were, um, is interesting and and it sounds very similar to our interview with gina ippolito back from march uh Mm -hmm. which i think was episode 61 of atomic monsoon oh but but both of you guys you know moved out to los angeles uh around you know in your early 20s and and i think she's around our age alex so um you know both of you guys have been have been out there you know working and 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 busting you know, bust an ass to, to get where you are. And, uh, yeah, after 10, 15 years of doing this stuff, it's paying off. Um, which is very different from the, the myth of Hollywood, right. Where it's like, you know, small town kid goes and writes a thing and and becomes a star overnight. Like, you know, this, this 15 year overnight sensation, uh, (laughs) story seems Mm. to be more and more the way things actually go. Yeah. And I mean, it's, everybody has a different journey, you know, going back to yeah. Going back to Ryan, I mean, he, you know, he did Fruitvale Station. I don't know if you've seen Ryan Coogler's um, first indie film. He did it at the right time. You know, it was about, you know, an unfair, you know, police shooting that happened at a time when the world was starting to talk about that more seriously. And so sometimes you, you, you do, you do capture kind of that lightning in a bottle at the right time. Sure. And, um, yeah. and, 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 you know, and then sometimes it takes longer, you know, I had a professor at USC, uh, he'd laugh to say professor because he, he hates that, but um, mm-hmm. Penn Densham, he did the Kevin Costner Robin Hood and the the Outer Limits, one of the reboots of the Outer Limits. He, he was also, he worked on Harriet as a producer and Whoa. such a really cool Zen guy. And he's always just like, you have to let it, you know, obviously you have to be tenacious. You can't just sit around and be like, oh, I'll be just someday crowned the filmmaker. But it's not going to happen that way, but right. you have to let it take the time it takes and realize that everybody is trying to make make you know put like a, a round thing into a square hole. I mean, basically everybody's trying to make something. Even people who have been successful are trying to be successful again. Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. it's going to take the time it takes. And sometimes it's it's developing your content and making it better and better. But it's mm-hmm. also just like, hey, did you happen to catch that meeting with that person at the time they were looking for this exact thing? You know, so. Um, right. You can only control what you can control. I can control going into Final Draft, which is my screenwriting program, and trying to make my script better and better, getting feedback. That's in my control. I can't control if someone's going to put money behind it, though. You know? Right. So, yeah. Um, so the more you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And that's, I mean, you can have the best script or the best product, even like not even filmmaking, right? You could have the best cola in the world. Right. That's, you know, the best tasting, but somehow has no calories or whatever and doesn't have any of the artificial sweeteners that may or may not cause cancer. Uh, Mm -hmm. But if no one's going to put money behind production on it, you know, be it a movie or or this fictional cola that I just made up or comic books or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, It it, great. You created a a wonderful thing that you and your friends get to enjoy. And that's it. You know, and I kind of feel like if you're in the creative field, you sort of need to be okay with that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, Steph, I totally cut you off, and then we went on like a three minute tangent. So, <laughs> no, you're totally good. I I had a question, and it was more, uh, just kind of like obviously it was directed to you, Alex. But um, the question kind of takes us off the tangent of what you've worked on so far. But it's an interesting one because everyone has like an interesting origin story. Because obviously you're doing the whole thing with Jumpman. Um, but my curiosity is, you know, what inspired you to be a screenwriter like, or a filmmaker or, or whatever, like what movie or TV series or person inspired you? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, when I was a kid, I was really into a lot of very flashy sci-fi movies. Like I loved back to the future trilogy, mm-hmm. um, Bill and Ted. I just recently saw the new Bill and Ted, which, you know, was, was really fun. Bill and Ted three. Um, 
And just a lot of those kind of, um, you know, those tentpole kind of sci-fi movies as a kid were really the, the kind of razzle dazzle that got me interested. And then Andy will probably laugh. I dragged him into making these little <laughs> amateur movies with my dad's like old, you know, VHS, you know, camera from what it, whatever it was, 1980s, late 1980s. And we were filming these little like very silly, you know, I, I, I had a, a vague concept of a, of, a, of a narrative that we put together. And, you know, they were all kind of, Mm-hmm. Right, they're all kind of sci-fi things, right? There was cyborgs. I remember, right? They were like, I remember cyborgs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> using the, the Terminator claw and everything that we had, and and you know, um, I think we did Bat Boy, Bat Boy, where it was like, oh, based on... Bat Boy, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, listen, but I guarantee you, Axe is not going to talk about cyborgs or Bat Boy on any other podcast because he doesn't have the history with us. So, uh, Bat Boy early 90s and it had batman returns even come out yet like it was this yes. was early in okay but it was still early 90s like the batman it was definitely before the batman forever jim carrey yeah um yeah and and you and your brother had the, all the batman costumes and everything and and yeah we just made half a movie that we never i don't think we ever finished um that was you know a retelling of the origin of batman but with all of us being you know but because uh, your brother's a couple years older than us so yeah, between eleven and fourteen. <laughs> oh, and my brother's and he's five years young. He was like six or seven at the time. Oh yes, yeah, he was in it. He was, he was, he was like evil little bat boy, like clone, right? <laughs> he's something like that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then cyborgs, the story where you got sucked into your computer, you got sucked into virtual reality or something. I mean, it was kind man, of a Terminator takeoff. Like five of the movies I made as a kid were me getting sucked into the computer. It was That's always true. like I went through a portal into some other <laughs> into some other world. And it was like basically the the forest behind our little forest behind our house where it was like, oh no, we're in some other world, you know. And <laughs> you were one of the freedom fighters, I believe, that in that world right. that, yeah. I, that I came. Although for some reason, I remember. You had like a shirt on that was that day. It had like <laughs> logos on it and stuff, and I was trying to explain it. So we changed your short your shirt, but then you had already we had already filmed some of it. So you had this like line about what happened to my shirt or something. Remember? Wasn't there like a whole thing about the shirt? I, I, oh man. Okay, so we're we're going back twenty five years to embarrassing childhood videos that uh, <laughs> hope, I, I hope don't exist anymore. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, I think I think I filmed all of it. I think I filmed the first part of it with no shirt on. I think because it was middle of summer, and and we were probably swimming or something. So it was just like me and some like neon green and pink shorts, like like probably even swim trunks because you know you guys had that that awesome pool. Um, yeah, and I think we filmed a bunch of it with me with like a towel around my neck, like a cape or something. And at one point, it started getting like colder out, like the weather. This is New England, right? So you know if you don't like the weather in New England, wait a minute. Um, <laughs> and it started getting cold out. So I was like, I got to film with a shirt on, uh, or I got to put a shirt on or whatever. And, and like, <laughs> yeah, like we teleported somewhere and, and I wanted it to be like, oh, somehow the teleportation, like put a shirt on me. And you're like, no, we stopped to get that. And I was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> it's his movie. <laughs> I was still thinking of continuity though, even at that age, continuity. So, yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I also remember the time that we tried to make a stop motion thing using your World Wrestling Federation Hasbro figures. Um, yes, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Million Dollar Man and, you know, Hulk Hogan and what else? Uh, uh, the Roddy Piper. Mm-hmm. He, he has that line about, like, I'm going to go backstage and, and wash myself. I, want... <laughs> I still use that. I still use that all <laughs> the time. <laughs> I wanted to say he's going to take a shower in, like, you know, the locker room. But, I you know, you're thinking on the spot because there's no script, right. you know? <laughs> right. I'm going to go uh, wash myself. Yeah. <laughs> All the time. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So Okay, so so there's some embarrassing stories. So uh, <laughs> I'm just going to yeah, stop I mean, talking for a while. No, long story short, I mean, yeah, it, that so I tried to as a child make little little videos and I brought in family members and friends and so and as I went up the food chain as a as a, as a kid to a teenager, I was you know trying to do more and more productions and then I went to, you know, Went to Georgetown and I did a couple of productions there. But again, looking back, you know, they were efforts. I wasn't quite at the point where I, I knew what I was doing or even like where, why I was putting the camera where I was putting it. Um, 
you know, and I bought a really, really uh, nice camera for the time. It was the Canon XL1, which Ooh. in the late 90s was like the big like video pro camera. I, I spent all my selling newspaper money on it, I remember. And um, so that was kind of, at least I had that. And then, but then, yeah, I, I applied to the USC School of Cinematic Arts MFA program. And, you know, that was the real, I, I, I give them a lot of credit because I went there and, you know, a lot of the things I teach now come from that. It was just, mm -hmm. you know, why are we putting the camera where we're putting it? You know, what cinematography, you know, camera shots and angles and, and moving shots and doing a shot list. And, um, you know, there's something about doing every part of production, having to be the sound person, the boom operator, having to mm -hmm. be, you know, the editing your movies, having to do production design, having to write them and having to direct them. Even if you just want to focus on one discipline, having to do it all. I think helps you in, in, in every area. So, you know, as a screenwriter, I think that having to have done sound on a set or having to design a set has made me realize like, oh, this is how space works and this is blocking. And, you know, it just makes you more aware. So, um, so I took the formal route of going to like a film school and a really nice one. And Unfortunately, I have a lot of student loans that I have to pay back, but you know, um, someday that thank thankfully they do have income based repayment options. So I'm oh, that's good. relying that's nice. on those right now, you know. Um, but hey, that's the goal to to get the big tent pole movie made and then pay those all off, right? Yeah, you know? those, uh, once those Jumpman royalty checks start coming in, that'll that'll pay off all of your uh, student debt. Okay. <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> okay well we just have a couple minutes left here alex do you want anyone finding you on social media or, or elsewhere on the internet sure you can find me at on instagram i am ag pick ag pick so it's like alex george pickering right twitter is alex g pickering is my handle and what else is oh i have a website if you just google alex george pickering you know it's agpickering.com but if you just google alex george pickering it'll come up so um those are the big ones i mean facebook i you know i that's you can find me there too but it's my name you know that's my that's that's more a smaller group of friends and so forth yeah you know alex when i was uh looking through all your videos and everything that you sent us and i was on youtube one of the next recommended videos um popped up on the uh on like the other suggestion side and I hadn't realized it before, but I think I actually referenced uh, one of your premiere videos when I was working at VA. Really? What yeah. Was really? Cause I, I was, I was trying to remember how to use something in premiere and you were doing a video on it. So I pulled it up and I was working on it at VA. And then when I was sitting there looking at it, I looked over, I was like, wait a minute. I think I've watched that video before. Oh, <laughs> wow. I was like, Oh my God, it is. <laughs> Well, that's funny. Yeah. I mean, those, you know, I make those for my students, but I, yeah, I, I, I sort of let a lot of them be just public. It's tutorial, like the tutorials, right? The walkthrough mm -hmm, tutorials. Yeah. yeah. So that's cool. Yeah. I'd be curious which one. I don't know if you remember. Um, uh, was, I think the green screen one. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> green screen premiere tutorial. Yes. With the, the shot of me from I did this web series, like instructional series called Creator Up a couple of years ago. Another thing we actually got paid for, which was fun. And um, I just took basically a shot from that to use for the tutorial. Very nice. Man, what a weird small world. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, Andy, okay. where, can we find, uh, where, where can everyone find Atomic Monsoon? <laughs> oh, well, you can find us right where you found us. Like, wherever you just listened to this episode, you can obviously find us more there. Uh, but <laughs> if you want to contact us, uh, you can hit us up hit us up on social media. Uh, on Twitter, we are Atomic Monsoon. Also on Facebook, just Atomic Monsoon. Uh, on Instagram, we are Atomic Monsoon with the underscore between the words. And then please send us emails at AtomicMonsoon at gmail.com. Um, and then you can find some fun logo stuff, shirts, uh, masks, masks, whatever, at our Redbubble store, um, mm -hmm. which is atomicmonsoon.redbubble.com. And uh, uh, you can find all of our past episodes on atomicmonsoon.com or on your favorite podcatcher. And there please rate, rate, review, subscribe. Uh, so that way you don't miss any future episodes. And then you can you know go back and listen to the, the like five other episodes we've referenced earlier <laughs> today. <laughs> Alex, thank you so much for coming on. This was yes, this was a lot you. of fun because 
uh, I didn't have to do any work. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you guys. I mean, this has been great. Yeah. I mean, I've listened to a couple episodes and to be here is to be on the other side of the mirror, so to speak, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if that's yeah. the right analogy, but you know what I'm saying. It's, yeah, it's close enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, uh, hey, thanks for listening, and have a great week, and be safe out there. And we'll catch you soon. Bye. Take care. Thanks, guys. <laughs>